Jane Treger. This is Talking Art. We're sitting at the Deerfield Arts Bank. It's closed for the summer, but it's filled right now with art. And it's Catherine Richotte's art. And we're going to interview her today and find out about it and how she makes it and why she makes it and who she is a little bit. Catherine, welcome. Thank you, Jane. So, um, we have landscapes, we have things that look like they might be some kind of fantasy. I'm not quite sure, you're going to explain it to me. We have things that look almost like illustration, book illustration, I could see it. And then some drawings, some different kinds of things. So we'll go through them all. And um, I think the, one of the oldest pieces that is here is this one that's, uh, what do you call this one? Do you remember? Um, I have it written down. Searching for something deeper. OK. So I, when I first saw it, I wasn't sure what I was looking at. Now I see it's a woman with blue hair. Is that correct? That's right. And she's in some world that is sort of anonymous or like buildings or something big. Yet she stands out remarkably because there's a cartoon character quality to the way you've drawn her. Right. What medium are you using? In this painting I used acrylic paints. I painted this painting about 15 years ago or so. I created a whole series of these paintings with women portraits, but they're very occluded. There's not a lot of detail on the face. Kind of an emphasis on the hair and the shapes of the hair and the different values and tones. And this was the one that sort of started off that series. The idea behind the background for this painting was inspired by um, the artist Gustav Klimt. I was um, and still am in love with his artwork and the way that he creates all these different patterns and um, he also has sort of a surreal element to his artwork and he connects deeply with nature like I do and that's not really evident in this one but it comes out later in the works that I've created. And is it one character that you take through or is it different women? It's different ones, different women. So they all sort of have different kind of themes and then there's uh, one that has a beehive hairdo and honeycomb background. There's one that has uh, bright red hair in a more of a bob and lots of different leaves and colors and that one's more garden inspired and some of them are inspired directly from women in my life that were good friends or that I looked up to and others were um, just sort of this one started off and it wasn't really anybody in particular but just sort of the beginning of the idea but it's one of my favorite ones because I love the colors it's one of my favorite colors there and have you finished with this series you accomplished what you were looking for yes I I felt pretty finished I did probably oh I think maybe seven of them or so and some of them have found their way to the houses of friends and people have gathered them along the way and some of them I still have. Are they, is the whole series called In Search of Something Deeper? No, I didn't name the series. I just um, had like a name for each piece. Uh huh. And are all these women searching for something? I wouldn't say so. I think it's more of like honoring each of each of them or the spirit of different types of women. One of them has a, a basket weave behind and more of like a traditional hair and kind of reminds me of my mom. So hmm. each sort of represents a different um, woman or role model. And this one probably is the one, be being the first one, it was more personal, directly related to myself and just sort of looking for what was going to be, what was going to be next in life. Aren't we all? Yes. Is the next piece the one behind you, the, the um, Tres Almendras? Yes. An almendra is a type is an, of tree? A type of almond. Uh, it's an almond tree, a tropical tree that grows uh, in Costa Rica, where I painted this. In Costa Rica. Yeah. So here I see this quality of the, of the drawn line. And here also, this is, this is what, watercolor? This is watercolor with ink. So the ink, the black line ink is painted in with a really small brush. 
um, and then watercolor paint is applied over that. And you've done more than that one, I know, because I saw one in the yeah, last show. Yeah, this is kind of a style that I take with me. It's my traveling painting technique. So if I'm out and about, if I'm hiking, or if I'm anywhere that life takes me, if I have my watercolor pad and my paints and my ink, I can, I can make one of these inspired and by the landscape. And the one I saw and sold was also three trees. Do you always look for three trees? I didn't intentionally. No? No. You'll have to look for that. I do like trees. Trees are high on it, my it list of things to paint. Epic Weekend. Yes. Top Mount Sugarloaf. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh-huh. So after that, is this very realistic one here? Yes. So in I was living in Costa Rica at the time um, and really enjoying taking photographs. Under of, the ficus tree? Yes, under the ficus tree. Taking photographs of things that inspired me, and a lot of the things that inspired me in Costa Rica were the small things, little tiny bits of nature that were beautiful. What's the and scale here? So the little flower in the center of that would be about the size of your pinky nail. So it's really zooming in on a kind of a micro little beautiful little world, world that I would pass by every day when I was walking my little ones to preschool. And so so you, you work from photographs? I, I, did, I, I do, at times. Whereas, Not always. Whereas the one that's up here is, is plein air. This is plein air, yeah. And this is working from the photograph that uh -huh. I took. And this feels, the next one over here, which you call offering, that feels like it's in the same vein. So Not for quite as small, but still. So a good friend of mine, Louisa, was feeling sort of um, stuck, I guess, and she made a suggestion. She, she said, well, why don't you try taking some of your photographs and marrying them together and sort of combining? And I uh -huh. thought, well, that's really what I need to do because I need to get more ideas from different places into one piece. So that's, this is one of the first ones of that inspiration where I started to blend photographs together. So these are, so the left and the right side, the, the foliage on one side is from a photograph that I took and so are the berries, which were berries that were picked on a, on a camping trip. Just like a nice little find was to find this bush full of berries. And so it just, it's like a real nice quiet moment. Is this camping trip around here? It was in um, New Hampshire. So Tell us where you're from. I grew up in Connecticut. Um, I was born in New Britain, Connecticut. I That's not too far away. Not too far away. Did I you lived, come up here to go to school? Um, I lived in Vermont and Costa Rica before settling in Hatfield um, and came to this area to study and finish my degree so that I could teach art. So did you have an arts education before? I did. I studied art at my first time around at university in Connecticut. I studied painting and fine art there, but I didn't finish the, do the degree at that time. I did that too. Yeah, I took Not some time and degree. enjoyed right. traveling and raising my babies. So. And, and so then you came, but you, you, you got a different degree when you came to BU, to, to, BU, to, um, to Mass. To UMass. UMass, yes. Yes, I, it was a, in art education. Ah, so now you're an educator. Now I'm an educator of art, yes. You teach? I teach pre-K to grade six here in Deerfield and also in Sunderland at the elementary schools. You must be incredibly busy. Yes, it's, it's a, a very rewarding, but it is very busy. Uh-huh, so are you, are you, pleased to be in this area? Does it satisfy you? I love the valley. I think it's got a, it's, I call it the magic valley because where else could you have so many different things all in one place? We've got farmland and farm stands and mountains to hike. We've got museums and art and education and hot air balloons that pass by on any given day. It's, it's gorgeous. It's, and I appreciate all that it has to offer. It's a great place to raise my kids. 
Wonderful. Do they go to school in the same schools you teach? They don't. They go to Hatfield Elementary School. Oh, well, that's what happens when you live in another town. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so tell me again, the medium here, this you said this was acrylic. What are these? So when I, when I was living in Costa Rica and, and prior to that, I used acrylic paints, um, and that was what I learned with. And I, although I appreciate it, it, it was nice to try oils, and I then wouldn't, I wouldn't go back, I don't think, to acrylic unless I had to these, logistically. These but two nature ones are oils. This is not. This is acrylic, the, this and is then the, we move uh, on to the more recent ones are in oil. Which is the, the ficus tree is an acrylic, and the one with the offering, the offering with the blueberries is, is oil. oil. Yes. And so I, you're you're more comfortable in that now. Yeah, I love the way the oil paint moves around. It's it's just so rewarding. Acrylic paint just seems so sticky in comparison when, once I started with the oil. Is the is this, this, is this the la last one? This, when, when should we be discussing this? Um, That's the next fellow? one in chronological order. And um, you said that you call that generation transformation. That's my daughter there um, holding a sparkler at night and swinging it around. And I took a photograph of that. Actually, no, I did not take that photograph. I, a family member did. So I got her permission to use it. and. Um, Added that into added the Luna moth in as I recreated the scene and what's that got um, a what moth? It's a Luna Luna, Luna moth. moth. So it sort of becomes a symbolic token yeah. here. So the Luna moth doesn't even have a mouth. It it lives for one week as a moth yes. in the stage of a moth, and I'm and I, I it's just such a beautiful beautiful creature, and it symbolizes the transience and the, the fleeting nature of our lives, and, and so does having children. They're, so, they're only young for a little while, and then they're, they leave that stage, and so it's kind of a combination of those ideas. And I wanted to sort of make it look plain air as if the moth just landed on the painting. Oh. I don't know if I've really achieved that effect, but... No, but uh, uh, Hearing the story behind the painting adds a lot to the painting, I think, to, for me. So what I'm, what I'm grasping here is something that's purely imagination, something here that the ficus tree that's, um, I should name them since, our, since it makes it a little clearer, the, um, under the, the ficus tree. Under the ficus tree is super real. And these last two that we've just discussed, the ones with the, with the blueberries, the called offering, and the one with your daughter, have this quality that's slightly, um, that's, that's an artificial quality that I really quite like. In the first one, you've put two pictures that may or may not have anything to do with each other. You just put them together so that they, each item becomes a symbolic message to the other part of the picture, the blueberries with the green leaves, and, and I'm not saying what it would mean, but there's, there, then, and then the blueberry, the, the offering of the blueberry bowl in, into the picture with the green leaves. Um, I also just noticed that there's something, are those birds on a leaf down below? There? Little birds that are in the branches, sort of enjoying a couple blueberries of a snapshot of the moment, not from a photograph, but just right. from the memory. So, that, so even more so. So there's the moth that you've put on here. There are the birds eating the berries here. There's something that you're adding to the picture that is not just painting a lovely scene out there, but really is a whole interior message that I find really intriguing. And. Um, it's a, it, in, in, these additions really enrich the painting. I mean, I think the child with the, with the um, what's it called? The sparkler. The sparkler is delightful. And I know that the photograph didn't show all those sweeping colors, did it? Swirls, no, not so much. No. 
Yeah. There's a and look at that look in her eyes of trans being transported somehow. And um, there's a little some, magic in there. There's a little magic in there. So uh, there's a little magic in these two as well. Yes. Yeah. I definitely. I. Is this real? It's part real. There's part, it's partly real. This the, one the back stones, here. It's a real place, but then everything sort of So it's, it was called, grew into you call it, it, it didn't, this didn't happen overnight? Didn't happen overnight. Didn't happen overnight. As if those vines didn't, those, those roots didn't grow like that so overnight. That's a, it took yes. a long time for that to evolve. And it took a little input and from human, yeah, yeah, yeah human definitely. interference. But it's a great fence. So it's an imaginary fence, completely. The stones in the foreground are real. The stones are, in, in this picture, this is like really early spring. So you're not seeing any vegetation, but it's part of a garden um, in the property that we have up in Vermont. And one, of the, one or two of the trees that are vertical in the background are also really there. But this is part of me sort of pushing because I've looked at that scene for, oh, 15 years. It becomes a little dry to just paint that one scene, so I thought, well, I need to push this a little bit further, and um, and just started adding in something, another thing or theme that sort of penetrates my work: the woven, the idea of things that are woven, that that are man-made, put together, and intertwined, and the idea of roots. Can one actually do this with roots? I would imagine. If oh, this is, were. this is, you've imagined this. I, was, I thought this was actually something that people did. So I think that um, one thing that I remember you commenting on when I brought this piece to the gallery before was that you thought that it was, that the scale didn't seem like it was really that big, but those stones are actually really, really big stones. But for some reason, the idea of the roots behind them like that dwarfs the whole image and makes it appear that they're smaller, that maybe that could actually occur at some micro level, but no, it's the stones Well, I, th huge. I think that you've proved that you can paint and draw anything. And, but clearly, where you excel is where you introduce your own imagination and create things that aren't really there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's move on to this one. So this is a this is again your your watercolor and pen. Yes. And here we're back to oils. oils. Right. Now, why does this feel like I'm in a storybook? This was really really fun for me to make. I was. Um, taking a narrative painting class at UMass, and um, we were practicing telling a story with, with, a, with artwork. And um, in this piece, I, I giggled throughout making it as I just sort of at, made it so silly. It just doesn't make any sense. How could you have a boat made out of a basket? But I love to canoe, and I love to be on the water, and I love lakes. and. Um, all the things that are in that boat are very calming and to me. You yeah. want to name them? Tomatoes? Melons? I would say fruit. I would say... Fruit, flowers? Yes, mangoes and watermelons and things oh, like that. Oh, here are those birds. There are the birds. It's the same exact birds in the same and position. And actually, I think that they, yes, they started here. Then they made their way over there. I love it. Yeah. So there's a lot of different things in here from um, inspired by other artists. The trees were kind of bringing back that Gustav Klimt from 15 years ago. Not that he made trees just like that, but I the way he the used the patterning, the patterning of space, yes. and the gold, and the gold, the use of gold, and the the um, stars in the sky are inspired by the mosaic on the roof of the Gala Placidia uh, in uh, Ravenna, which is a um, tomb made for Gala Placidia, who was this woman who uh, was an uh, empress. Gala Placidia? Uh, Gala Placidia. She was an emperor's 
daughter and uh, an empress. She what, was an empress. Were these and she was really supportive metal of the arts. items that are attached to the tomb? No, these were. This is the pattern, but it would have been it would have been in mosaic. A so mosaic. little gold pieces of or glass with gold painted on the back. And did you write a narrative before you painted this? There's no there's no verbal narrative or actual story, but it's just more of a visual narrative of you know here's this scenario where there's room for me on that boat with my good friend. Is that you, Louisa? No, that's a friend of mine. She's my um, number one inspiration in art. She's the one who makes my suggestions and really gave me space when I was much when I was young and first getting started. She just sort of gave me the space to. To, to make art. That's wonderful. So she's honored here. She always is honored in my artwork. Yeah. So what, if you were to describe what pulls together your artwork, what would you say? Overall, I think nature makes it into everything. I love, I love nature, and that's where I'm most comfortable, being outside and being surrounded by what we have. And sort of, I attach, I attach symbols to that. I attach meaning to it in my mind, and I try to put that out onto the canvas. And I don't think that it's always understood, but it doesn't matter so much if everybody understands it. It's more for myself. Is, does that apply also to the small items that you do here? Or are those more like I diaries? Yeah, definitely more like journaling with the little ones. There's sort of like a snapshot or a photograph of a place. But it gives me the, by sitting down and taking a moment to actually make a painting of a place, you're impressing it in your mind much more so than a photograph ever would. I agree with you completely. I think it's very important to see if we can teach people to go on vacations without a camera so that they spent more time looking rather than framing and click, clipping, clicking. Right. Hmm. Yes. So what are you working on now? Well, I've been doing some portraits um, and thinking about how to evolve the portraits. I feel like I need to sort of come full circle with what I've done and in my early education, I did do a lot of portraits and really enjoyed doing them. And I feel like it needs to come back around, but somehow incorporate everything else that's happened since then into that. Well, those, that early one, oh, I I I'm sorry, I forgot that. It's searching for something deeper. You said about that whole series that they, um, I can't remember how you said it exactly, but they, they don't have really identifying facial features. Right, and I don't think that would happen with the next ones. So I was it thinking more about the it might be interesting to see these same people as they are mm. more really. I think you're right. So if that one is sort of based on you, might you do a self-portrait? Might I? Yeah, I think that it's definitely going to take the form of the, the actual people and not just these representations of sort of these in more ambiguous people, but the actual people in my life that have been amazing and that I, I just want to honor them, honor these people. And do you have a painting of your other child? That. Not that, that, not one that rivals that, so I do need to work on that. That's. That's a uh -huh. could be a bone of contention if I don't get on that right away. Yes, yes. I planted a plant for each of my grandchildren, and you have to make sure that you know they they know it, so they want to see the plant, and you have to take good care of the plants; <laughs> they can't you know die off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I look forward to seeing some self-portraits and some portraits. Yes. What do you, when when you teach art to children? How do you bring your own abilities to a place where they're accessible to the children? How do you do that? Making sure that they have the freedom of their ideas, that they're... Well, how do they learn? How did, I mean, how did you learn this technique? Technique, 
technique comes with, with practice, so, and by observation. So I try to help them, I try to have them practice their powers of observing what they're seeing. But that's just a piece of it. It's so, so hard to learn the, the, you can observe, but I see the frustration of children when they can't seem to make something look real. So they go back to doing cartoons. It seems it, always like age eleven happen. or so. It does happen if there's some self, if there's some insecurity around that. But I think that when you start them really, really young, observing, they they can become more proficient when they're much younger. In third grade, I've seen great still lifes, great observational drawings, and I think but you that don't, it's you like don't think the in bike. The, you don't think that learning the tool of the pencil is essential. Of course, of oh. course, yeah. But I start them young on that. I have a pretty high bar for them. You know, I want them to feel success. So I think that um, it, you want to ha have a high expectation of what they can try to do. And so if you give them the right materials and sort of have a little hope and, 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 and encouragement. Sounds to me like that's probably what happened. Some, someone did that for you. Yeah, I definitely, my mother was, um, a creative person and she definitely allowed us opportunity to make to make things she liked to make things and make spaces and aesthetics she is very much into aesthetics and Louisa also was the one who when I when I, I to be quite honest I did not really know that I was going to be pursuing art until I was in my first year of college when I first graduated high school um, it, I knew that I liked it, but it didn't occur to me that I had any talent or skills at that time until I sort of started to take company with people who are also talented and creating and just sort of giving me that encouragement and that mental space. It's really important to have mentors. To have people. People yes. who are going to say, yes, you can do this. Absolutely. Or how about this? Exactly. And so you've taken that role. That's beautiful. I, um, I am um, grateful to have uh, had the opportunity to find out what motivates you and uh, what interests you and to hear how you came about to create these things. I like seeing the different kinds of things that evolved and I look forward to seeing whatever comes next, those portraits. Thank you. I'm thank you very about much. Them. And yes. thank you very much for having me here today. You're it's most a welcome. Pleasure. This was an interview with Catherine Bruchot, and I'm Jane Treger, and we are at Talking Art, taking place at the Deerfield Arts Bank. And next week, we will have yet another interview with another local artist. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>